evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, wherever you are today. Thank you for joining us today on Bites and Banter. I'm very happy to have our guest, Bimbala Kolawale, today, an energy analyst. We're looking forward to discussing with her about what's currently happening in the world, the effect of the pandemic on the oil and gas industry, and her own personal experiences also with the, with the pandemic. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Bimbola. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ola. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So today on our, you know, uh, um, Bites and Banter, um, for people who don't know, um, this is organized by Women in Tech Africa. This is an organization that is um, very strong on supporting women entrepreneurs, especially also women in tech, and also trying to create a pipeline for young girls to um, look for not only careers, but studies also in technology. So I'm happy to be speaking to uh, a techpreneur at heart, but of course, uh, somebody you know, who's grown in her industry and who's also um, a, a specialist in her area. So Bimba, let's just dive right into it. I mean, right now, um, we're seeing the effect of the pandemic. And to be very honest, I mean, basic things like I haven't, I think I filled my car once the last three months. I didn't have okay. to buy gas. People didn't have to leave home. But of course, I mean, planes weren't flying, which means that on the one hand, while we were keeping our health, some people were losing up pretty badly, especially the, yeah. you know, the, the oil and gas industry. So can you take us a little bit through what is currently happening there? What is the impact? I mean, like uh, every other industry, well, every, every other part of the world really has been impacted. So not just the oil industry, um, but uh, with the oil industry, the, the, the uniqueness of that is that uh, the impact has been on the fact that the demand for uh, oil and gas or fossil fuel, so to speak, uh, has dropped. Of course, we are all at home and, uh, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's no one flying. Well, now there are planes going back and forth, but at, of course at a very reduced uh, rate. So the consumption of, of oil, jet, jet fuel, you know, road transportation, and, uh, and so much uh, and so on and so forth, even the heavy industries that would, you know, use a heavy, a heavy amount of, of, uh, of oil uh, uh, or refined oil or even uh, diesel and the derivatives essentially uh, have, they've all been on pulse just because of this um, COVID situation. And also um, the, in the industry, the oil industry, the oil and gas industry is huge. So you have the upstream space, you have the midstream, and of course you have the downstream. So within the upstream space, it's the exploration and production phase. And even within that, you have the oil services that are servicing the exploration and production company. So, you know, it's been green within the oil service space as well. It wasn't just COVID that also affected the oil industry. There was also, um, you know, the whole OPEC plus uh, uh, meeting and uh, coming to an agreement of, you know, are they going to reduce the amount of production per day, you know, based on the respective OPEC countries. But, you know, the plus would be Russia because Russia isn't part of OPEC. So we have that that also affected the oil industry as well, you know. So that really, you know, put a dent uh, within, the, within the industry. But that said, it is, it, I, I don't want to use the term that it's bouncing back but it's stable at the moment with oil price bouncing around between, I would say 34 to about $40 barrel. And this is for the Brent and the WTI is around that 30. The WTI was the one that crashed some, some months ago in April. Yeah, it was at zero, right? Or I think it actually went into a minus. Can that be? It was minus 39. Well, minus 36 to minus 39, they're about minus 36. I'll settle for, for, for that. And, um, uh, and the WTI means the West, uh, West Texas Intermediate. It's a price benchmark uh, for, for, the, for the US and the rest of the world uses the price benchmark for Brent. So Brent didn't go to negative. It was WTI that went to negative. But as every other thing, when US is involved, the whole world okay. thinks everyone else is involved. So um, going back to the impact of, of COVID, it has affected the entire university, it affected the entire uh, industry. And, uh, um, you know, all service companies, their revenues are tanked. And of course, if your revenue is tanking, uh, they, they, I mean, 
well, maybe not the revenue is tanking, the revenue is tanking basically because there's no work for them to do. Um, and of course, that's because the EMP companies themselves have had to, you know, put a pause and they've had to uh, re-adjust. Uh, they've gone, gone back to their books to see what projects can be put on hold and what projects, you know, they have to continue with regardless of, you know, the crash, uh, essentially. So, yeah, um, that's, that's pretty much it. Because, I mean, I'm just looking, so if we just um, piggyback on, on the first question, we're looking also at there is a socioeconomic effect from mm. this whole pandemic. And uh, yeah. oil producing countries, of course, the, the um, population of the countries that are oil producing, what is happening there? How, how are they affected? Right, that's a very good question. So um, the, the producing countries will be the likes of Nigeria. Yeah, uh, for example, yeah. Um, Angola, you have Equatorial Guinea. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about Africa. Or yes, I'm, yes. Well, okay, so if we're talking about Africa, yes, these are the ones. And within North Africa, of course, uh, Algeria, which is a huge gas producer. Um, the economy, if we use Nigeria as an example, the economy, of course, it, it, has, it has affected it. It's taken a dent. Uh, um, uh, to, to, to an extent, but this is something that actually has been ongoing in terms of um, ni the Nigerian states having to look to diversify the economy and not necessarily have to rely on the energy space, on the oil and gas revenue. Uh, because, you know, for when you are a producer within a country, if you're a producer nation or even a producer, um, you can't just close your producing tap just like that because it gets more expensive if you close it to restart that tap. And what I mean by tap essentially is the wells, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to continue to produce. And when they continue to produce, you have to store it somewhere. And then when you store it and you don't have any buyer, then there's no revenue coming in for, uh, into your country. And this is what has happened with COVID with a lot of um, storage tanks being filled up. And of course, countries are closing their borders and not allowing, you know, uh, unrefined crude or even refined crude, so to speak, mostly unrefined crude to come into their, into their country. So it has uh, affected um, uh, the, uh, the, the economy, uh, uh, really. Uh, but of course, there's so many other aspects uh, whereby the Nigerian states can probably start to look uh, at a positive side of things, i.e., um, something I like to call maybe energy pro progression as opposed to, you know, transition, because that's been a big topic lately, actually prior to the whole COVID situation. So if that can happen with, you know, consumption, looking towards the consumption of solar energy, right now there's a lot more consumption within the, um, uh, 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 a lot more use of, of traditional methods of, of energy uh, source. So if that can now be, you know, translated or, you know, progressed into the use of solar and all of that, maybe we can start to see some positives, uh, 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 positivity within, you know, the social economic states of the nation. Again, this is just using Nigeria as an example. Of course. Uh, because over-reliance on oil revenue, um, what then happens when, when, when everything, every, everything tanks? I mean, we've seen this happen over uh, and over again. Uh, this happened in 2014 during the Shale Revolution. And, um, you know, countries like uh, Angola suffered deeply. You know, of course, Nigeria also uh, suffered uh, significantly. You know, you can imagine oil price going from 120, 100, 100 to $120 a barrel yeah. and tanking down to 20 you know. So you've already had some sort of break-even uh, uh, price that you've, you've used to benchmark, you know, your major projects and then the oil price tanks then you're unable to go forward with that. And the ripple effect of that is what then goes into the economy and the economy is unable to progress. So it's important for countries and economies within the African states, the oil producing ones, to start looking um, uh, inward and, and, and see what else uh, they have and you know, use that as opposed to the over-reliance on, on mm -hmm. just... And this is 2020 going forward. So many other things that one can do to help uh, uh, the country uh, to grow. Doesn't have to be just oil, really. Okay. That sounds so, like killing my industry, but that's not the intent. 
<laughs> no, no, but I mean, it, it would be interesting, right? Because I mean, uh, people are talking about alternative sources of energy, for example. Um, you just mentioned solar power, and there yeah. are some countries that have hydroelectric power, for example. But yeah. the, the question is, I mean, we are overly dependent on all we've always been. And um, how do you wean people away from something like that? And I did hear that although solar, yes, but it could be also expensive to install and the maintenance is also a problem. So how do you actually offer people a possibility to move from oil into, well, you, you are also a renewable expert, right? In, into, that, into that sector. Yeah. So again, um, as I mentioned, I, I'm a big fan of energy progression. So moving people right into the renewable space um, within the African context can be challenging. Um, it will be challenging. The first step will be education. They need to be educated. Everyone needs to be educated on how the solar energy would work for them. Again, as you mentioned, it, it is expensive. I agree. It's about, the, I think, the battery, if we look at it in Naira terms, depending on the size, uh, of, of the property where it will be installed or the, you know, the amount of equipment that this, you know, panels would need to work for. The batteries goes for around, I think, 500,000 Naira. Um, in pounds, that would be um, maybe a thousand pounds or something. Okay. You know, it would be roughly a thousand pounds, I think. So, so yeah, so that, that's a little bit pricey. Um, but prior to that, of course, you know, Apart from producing oil, the, the country, well, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa even, um, there's a lot of gas you know, resource. And gas is the, is the clean form of the fossil fuel. So you have you yeah. know, the coal, the oil, gas, and so on and so forth. So gas is the cleaner version. So more consumption of gas internally can you know, help to bridge that gap between over-reliance um, um, of, of oil, for example. And then, of course, you know, when that is married together with the use of, you know, solar and, um, and possibly other forms, um, hopefully we're able to get into to wind. Um, I'm guessing South Africa would be a perfect, you know, yeah. example uh, of using, um, of, of having that wind, wind uh, project. Um, I think there's more wind there than, than other parts of, 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 of of Sahara Africa. I may be wrong. Mozambique and Tanzania may also uh, enjoy that as well. I'm not sure of Nigeria, not so much. Nigeria will be more of solar. The entire West Africa probably will be more of solar, um, to the best of my knowledge. So, okay. yeah, it's education. Education, education, education. So, once people are educated on what to do and, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and how, to, how to do things, how to consume it, you know, uh, storage pattern and things like that. It it would it would get. Um, I think it would get better, and uh, the 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 positive impact uh, in the respective nations will 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 be felt. In okay. to the best, uh, of my knowledge, in my opinion, at least. Okay. So let's try and connect the dots between what you do, um, especially between Europe and Africa. I know that you head the business development um, section for uh, the African region in your company. And yep. this allows you to um, not only experience the African part, but also the European part. So help yep. us connect the dots between um, both continents, how they benefit from each other and what exactly you're doing there. Yeah, so um, I work for a company, uh, an energy intelligence company. Um, back in the day, we used to pride ourselves as an oil and gas intelligence company, but we've moved from there to energy now that we're in renewables. Mm -hmm. And um, I have been uh, in charge of the African markets for uh, some years now and doing business in Africa. My God, it's not a walk in the park. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it's not, regardless of being African, uh, it's, it's not a walk in the pack. Um, most especially, again, being Nigeria. I love Nigeria. Nigeria is my country. Uh, but yeah, doing business there, um, is, uh, it comes with its own challenges and it also comes with its benefits because the most important part, uh, or part of this is um, understanding um, uh, the, the, should I say the local knowledge? Because local knowledge is very important. If you're going to do business in any part of the continent, and now I'm talking about Africa and sub saharan mm -hmm. Africa, to be specific, local knowledge um, is very important. And it's not just the knowledge, but also understanding their way of doing business. If you do not have these things, 
at the back of your mind and you go there with your maybe i'll say with your um maybe swiss experience or or london experience uk experience you know you go there with your norwegian hats and you go oh yeah this is how we do it in norway so it should apply in nigeria i'm sorry um yeah i'm I'm just sorry it's it's not it's not going to happen because it's different and it's not unique to just africa it's it's everywhere the asia asia community is also like that uh in the sense that it's very relationship based so that is how i've been able to marry the two the european um uh experience is based on the fact that, okay, this is the service you provide. You provide this consultancy services and uh, uh, huge business intelligence uh, data. Okay, I see it. I need it. Send me the contract. But with the West African side and even South, to be fair, with the sub saharan Africa side, most importantly, it's more of, okay, I see it. I understand it. I get it. Let me think about it and then we can talk more. So the way I do my business in, in, in Sub-Sahara Africa is basically to gain their trust first. Explaining to them what it is all about, understanding their need, uncovering their need, because my experience in Norway or in the Netherlands or in, in the UK, it's yeah, it is the same of un- uncovering the need. But once the company sees that, okay, we do need this, they go straight into the price. My experience in Nigeria, on the other hand, would be to ask me for the price first. And then I try not to say the price. I try to show them what it is all about, understanding their need, marrying it to what I have, and then mentioning the price. So when I say it's not a walk in the park. (laughs) So I guess it it sort of depends on you try to meet your customers where you know that well, should I say the customer experience is the most important. And of course, because your customers are diversified also from their, um, from their backgrounds, if you offer them beer when they want water, well, you're not going to get the the right answer, right? Exactly. It's, it's not going to happen. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how it's pretty, it's, it's been both the, 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 uh, the, the similarity between the two is that you, you still have to continue and give the best, you know, of, mm-hmm. of, you know, service. So it doesn't end when I sign the contract and, you know, and then they pay for the services and then, you know, we wish each other goodbye. It doesn't end there because it's a contract. So I still need to, 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 to work with them throughout mm-hmm. the process of them being, you know, my clients. Of course, also working towards ensuring that they actually renew. So they stay uh, with me as, as, as a client. So it's it's been um, it's been very rewarding, you know. It's been from the likes of you know government officials uh, in different countries, Uganda, uh, Kenya, most recently Chad, um, Cote d'Ivoire, and then of course uh, um, uh, EMP companies and international oil companies as well. And even in other countries in the Middle East, I'd received a call just last week from the Middle East saying, "Oh yes." you are in charge of Africa. This is what I need. We're, we're looking to do this project in Ghana and all of that. So of course I t- took them through all the process mm-hmm. and brought in my colleague who is in charge of business in the Middle East. Okay. That's also very important because he's in charge of business in the Middle East, even though this company is from the Middle East looking to do business in Africa. Mm. So this, this, you know, so you have to marry all that relationship and give, at the end of the day, you have to give the client that sort of, you know, um, um, what would I say it now? Uh, basically, just put their mind at ease and let them know that you know, you're all working for the common good for their own benefit. So, yeah, that's uh, that's it. I, I've probably said more than I should. But. No, it, it's you know, I mean, of course, we want to tickle out all the stuff that you have for us, so that's totally fine. But it sounds yeah. like you know, you're doing a whole lot of relationship management, a whole lot of stakeholder engagement, and yeah. uh, does that weigh on your mind? Is it heavy or is it something that you just love to do and it, it comes extremely naturally? You know, that's a very good question. Um, I haven't thought about that in a very long time. Maybe it comes across quite naturally and, uh, and, and sometimes it goes, you know, it, just, it doesn't really weigh on my mind, but sometimes it does, you know, when you see that you've done everything you can and, you know, there's maybe someone still somewhere trying to say 
actually, I'm not sure we actually need this company service. We should go for the other one. And then you start wondering, what else do I need to do? <laughs> you can see that we meet all the things that you need. And, you know, we we're even going to give you more. You're able to just go on our website. You look at the people page. My face is the first page, but the, the first that you see. I sort of stand out. <laughs> so, yep. <laughs> can't hide so that. What, <laughs> so what more, you know, um, we would give you this, we would give you that. And yeah, it comes naturally. But when you've given your all and, uh, and you're told, oh, we're not sure. I mean, you would understand. It could be a budgetary situation. It could be that their circumstances have also changed. Maybe they're not going to be able to work on the project anymore. Maybe they haven't been able to land the, maybe it's a marginal field bid round and they've not been able to land a particular field they're trying to bid for. Um, you know, different things can, can, can occur uh, during that time. But never, ever, I have to say, has anything to do with the quality of the products or data. That it's, it's, it's never about that. It's usually more often than not, maybe there's some interest, special interest elsewhere, or maybe price. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, just, and maybe, maybe this is a bit of more of a personal question. Since you are, you are in this business, have you ever had times where you've sort of maybe doubted your capabilities or wondered whether, you know, you needed to do a lot more just to, to show oh, that yes. you're an expert in your area? Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. I, I have had several times. Um, I don't know if that has to do with, uh, uh, maybe again, maybe heading, you know, being in charge of the African market because it comes with its own challenges. The challenges mm -hmm. are enormous, you know, and, you, and also to be fair, I also deal with European clients as well. So, um, you know, the areas where you'd be like, Oh, okay maybe I should have done this or maybe I should have done this. But you know, each time I, because at the end of the day, I, I, I can't get it all and I'm not perfect, you know. So I'm, I'm a big fan of continuous, you know, education. Mm -hmm. or you know, keep learning type of person. That's, that's who I am. I'm always, always willing to learn and always willing to, to find new ways. So when I see that I haven't, or I feel I haven't quite delivered, I will go back to my drawing board and check, okay, what, could I have done better? Or, you know, how could I have, you know, answered this question or how could I have helped, you know, this client to see what they're trying to achieve or this prospect to be able to, you know, dance my way and see that, okay, this is what they, you know, they're offering and it does answer my question. So, so yeah, there, there are times that I, that I do doubt myself, but I never let it show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you know how to play that game. <laughs> We all have to, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah. so I, I know I've taken you on a little journey. I was going to ask you, I mean, working in the oil and gas um, um, industry, and then we have climate change. Yeah. So um, there's a lot going on about climate change today. And my question to you, is that really the silver bullet that is going to help us or... Um, is it just one of those things that we have to deal with as we go along the line? Because people are expecting to be a bit more radical. And of course, I've seen this pandemic has, um, now nah, you can see basically because of the pandemic, the things were able to go back to nature. We could actually see yeah. the effect of not, you know. So, I mean, the question would be to you, what are your thoughts on this? You know, um, yeah, it's it's a very, very tricky situation. I've been told by friends or friends of friends or new friends hey you're in, you're in an industry that destroys the world <laughs> <laughs> you know what i don't know about that but yes uh climate change of course is is, is very very real um and like you said you know we've seen the effect everyone is at home now and we can see how suddenly everywhere is cleaner you know we can just you know walk to river things and you see you actually see fish which you probably haven't seen in a long time. So yes, it is real and it is, um, and we need to, as a people, we need to, you know, think uh, more about uh, the world and, and, and the universe. However, I, I, I don't think that affects um, uh, the oil industry. I'm trying not to get political because I'm not, sorry, I don't have that, you know, political knowledge and all of that kind of thing when it comes to the whole oil industry and climate 
change perspective. But um, yeah, it's 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 a tricky one. Um, I, I guess as 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 you know, the human race, we just need to to take over our environment. It's it's really really important. And I guess with the less uh, use or consumption of fossil fuel, maybe oil, um, there'll be more consumption of gas. Of course, it's a cleaner version, and then even way more uh, consumption of you know renewables then that would probably really help but the big question is um how soon we don't yeah. know yet um if you look at africa for example nigeria again as an example by 2030 so this is 2020 mm -hmm. within the next 10 years nigeria is expected to reach population of about 700 million yeah so the energy source will come from where? So we need to ask these questions. But that doesn't mean I'm advocating, you know, for us to, to damage our environment, no. But at the same time, you know, the energy source will come from where? Do we want to continue to use the same uh, biomass that, you know, um, uh, we've been using for, for quite some time now? Um, uh, or do we want to get on the cleaner side of things? Because even biomass is not particularly clean. It does affect, if you're going to the rural, rural side of the nation, it does affect those women and families okay. that are yeah. things, you know. So we need to advocate and get them to use cleaner energy. And of course, again, that goes back to solar. And how many of these people can actually afford that type of energy just yet? Again, this is where gas still comes yeah. in. So it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Again, I'm a big fan of, you know, living clean. We, you know, we want a cleaner environment. We want to be safe. A friend of mine actually said to me, I think that should be locked down maybe like for a month every year for people to reset and just, you know, <laughs> you know, going forward. So I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I've been able to answer, answer that question because it's almost sounds. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not. Sometimes I, I just think. Um, it's not clear cut, is it? Yeah, and I sometimes I, I wonder if it's, um, I know climate change is, you can feel it everywhere, but if I can't get three meals a day, am I worried mm -hmm. about climate change? I get you. You know, you know I, I, I ask those questions because I mean, I'm in a situation whereby I can actually feel it. But I mean, if, for example, now with the lockdown, I know, for mm -hmm. example, in, in Lagos, people, there are people who live from hand to mouth. They need to survive. If they stay at home, then they would probably die of hunger than, than yeah. die of, you know, of, of COVID, of the virus. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And these are people who are probably yeah. coping with kerosene and stuff like that. So um, yeah. if you talk to them about climate change, I, I find that it would probably be different. I mean, of course you can always educate people, but you know, in the um, SDGs, it's also one yeah. of the goals for 2030. Exactly. If, you know, yeah. if your country is still fighting with many basic things, um, is climate change one of the biggest things on the agenda on for the them? And exactly. can they afford it first? I mean, if you have a certain level of comfort, then you can start to increase the the you know what to expect from 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 the country. Yeah, yeah, and I mean to be fair, again, you know, it all goes back to education. You know, if people are educated, but by education, I don't mean I don't mean you know being in the four walls of a university or being in a, you know four walls of a classroom, which of course is very important. But you know having that open mind, having been open to, to learn, you know. So if people are educated about the impact of, you know, what would happen, you know, if we don't save, you know, the world, so to speak, then maybe people can start looking towards that. However, like you said, you go to some certain parts of the world and their daily, you know, survival is what comes to mind first. And mm -hmm. may change. They'll tell you to come back in 10 years time and come and remind them about it. But right now, they just want to survive for now. Yes. You know? So it's, it's a tricky uh, and challenging, you know, situation. But I do hope, um, you know, um, whatever, whatever it is, I do hope we do, you know, find it, um, find, find a plausible way uh, mm -hmm. to, to make things positive and to make things go on in a very good way that would, you know, be beneficial to all. So one question to you, how have you been dealing with this pandemic? Um, what has been the effects for you? Are you do you have positives that you, you've come out of with, with this pandemic? Or yeah, let us okay. share, share a little bit with us how that's <laughs> been for you. 
Okay, that's that's going a little bit personal, but that's okay. I I, I would share. Um, to start with, I think with the pandemic, I've realized that I haven't actually had time to rest. I have been working so much. And I guess that's not just me. It's a sentiment that a lot of people are feeling because there's a bloodline between, or a bloodline between, you know, your nine to five that has now been translated to 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. It's just not healthy <laughs> because, you know, you come, you get out of your room and the next thing you flip your laptop open before you're even thinking of anything. And then you see some emails and you're already like into it. Oh, I need to solve this problem before I get on, you know, before I get my cup of tea. And then you grab the cup of tea and you see another one. Mm, yeah, it's, it's so nice. And I think right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so nice. And I think we really need to take a step back and, and, you know, for, for people that have this experience, because other people that don't have this experience because they've either been laid off or followed would think, oh, you're having it good. At least you're busy. But for those that are busy, I am talking to myself right now as well is to actually relax and take a, a step back because, uh, you know, if you're not 100% with your health because you're overworking, then, you know, why are you overworking? So, so that's how, I've, uh, I mean, yeah, that's what has been happening, but um, I've actually, you know, started to, to, you know, relax in between, you know, take a long walk to the park, relax. And now that the sun is out, it's just amazing. Yeah. And I started during this uh, uh, lockdown, which I didn't think I probably would ever have actually thought about. I'm very good with advising people. People come to me, a lot of my friends, a lot of people come to me and they go, Bim, this is what I have in mind. Do you think I can, you know, change this to a business? Can I, can I do this as a business? What do you think? And, you know, so I'm very good with that, but I've never actually thought about that for myself. Okay. I do sometimes, but not every time. And I started a podcast. Ah, nice. <laughs> and nice. Honestly, I actually was thinking of starting a YouTube at first, but then I thought, uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> So I started a podcast and it's been fun. I actually like it, you know, and it falls within just, you know, chatting with women and men. And the men are those that are interested, you know, in the growth of, of, of the African continent. And you could be from anywhere. You don't have to be African. In fact, one of the guys that I've interviewed is actually uh, Italian, but born in Brazil. So, and also chatting with women, you know, what they've been doing, their career wise and things like that. And okay. you know, younger People can look up to them. So yeah, it's, that it's sounds uh, nice. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I has given me something. <laughs> I, I think um, yeah, the pandemic has. I guess it has opened doors in in you know in our lives to try and you know maybe rethink things. But as you said about the work, that the lines now are completely blurred. And, um, you know, if you have kids, then you have the additional challenge that everything still has mm -hmm. to run plus that also. And um, some people don't actually have the time to sit down and think. So whereby yeah. some people could actually utilize that time. It's like when they go to bed, they're so happy that, you know, <laughs> the day is over and then the next one is about to start. Um, and I guess part of it, as you said, being disciplined and being nice to yourself and really trying to force yourself into taking those breaks and being healthy is, is one of those things. So I, I would just give this to everybody on the call. Yet you need to take care of yourself because nobody else would do it for you. Absolutely. <laughs> honestly, it's, you know, it's 100%. not so easy out there. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Dim, thank you so much. Um, I think, does anybody have any questions to Bim? Just unmute yourself and ask. Or I can unmute you and ask if you let me know. <laughs> Yeah, I guess no questions. <laughs> I guess there are no questions, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bim, thank you very much for joining us today. It was very nice chatting with you. Um, I wish you all the best in your thank endeavors. You. I also hope that um, I get to listen to your podcast sometime soon and <laughs> listen to what you're doing. It's not doing. just listening. I'm going to have you on the podcast. So brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> excited yes thank you very much thank you very much viewers also for joining us this evening for our episode of bites and banter by women in tech africa i wish you a pleasant evening and talk to you soon bye-bye thank you bye